Your brain is like a hungry sponge. It's constantly absorbing information. What are we saying by raising an eyebrow? What matters more, being right or fitting in? Why is it that we love destroying things? Why? Our lives are full of decisions that we think we make of our own free will. But do we? It can tell me what I was going to do before I know I was going to do it. What? Yeah. Psychologists say that fewer than three days in a room like this can lead to brain damage. I will be staying in this room for three days. I am so confused. Your brain can be useful. <laughs> it can be dangerous. <laughs> and it can be a lot of fun. Hello. Keep it going, Michael Stevens, ladies and gentlemen. Right? Yeah. Awesome. So awesome. Oh man, so so excited to have you here, Michael. Thank Great you to be for here. joining us, and welcome to Build. Uh, congratulations on the show. Thank so you very much. much. And everything you've been doing. You've been super busy lately. Super busy. I've got a show tonight. Uh, Adam Savage and I are traveling around the U.S. How with a cool live science that? show. Yeah. And then there's Minefield going into the mind, specifically my mind a lot of the time. Yeah. Kind of scary, but uh, very. it was very fruitful. We've got we've got uh, we've got some time. We're going to talk about all kinds of different things. But you just mentioned working with Adam Savage. How did you get roped in with that? How has that been? I imagine that's that's an experience in and of yeah, itself. Right I had there. no idea what it was going to be like. I've never toured live. This is literally 41 shows in 47 days, traveling by bus. You sleep at night, and then you wake up, and the bus has arrived in some next city. And it's been great to, to be able to travel and meet people and interact with them. I think they can learn a lot more and come away with a lot more than you could do through just a screen. It's, uh, it's incredible. And, and amongst all of that, you found the time to come hang out with us. Man, I don't know how you found the energy. It worked out Thank perfectly. Yeah. yeah, the show's not until tonight. So what Perfect. else am I going to do but yeah. hang, out with, hang out with you? Well, with me and all of these wonderful people and right here. And all of these wonderful people and all yeah. of you out there digitally. Those on the internet. Yes. Well, uh, again, thank you. Uh, you know, I got to wonder, last question about Adam. You guys are touring together. There's a bus. Is he one of those prank guys? Like you're getting going from place to place doing fun little jokes and practical things. It feels like that's right in his wheelhouse. Well, yeah, but he hasn't pranked me yet. Maybe he's working on the long con, and there's something that is, um, you know, I'm going to wake up one morning, my bed will be in the middle of a lake. I don't know. But <laughs> one, one can hope. <laughs> one can hope. Uh, I want to go back for a second. I want to start uh, kind of in the beginning, because it's 2017, and if uh, my research is correct, you started 10 years ago, uh, give or take, right? Kind of creating videos and throwing them up there in the Wild West that was yeah, the Yeah, I was in college when YouTube was invented, yeah. and I was doing theater and also doing an English literature and a neuropsychology degree, all simultaneously, but wow. then YouTube came in and said, hey, here's a platform where you can distribute yeah. a show for free, and I could combine both of those things, science and performing, and I taught myself how to edit, I learned how to create video content, and then uh, the rest is history. Uh, for sure. I, in the early days, uh, a lot of it, I think there was a lot of video game and web culture stuff. There was science too, of course, that was always a part from the beginning, but when did you start to uh, lean a little more heavily into the science? When did you sort of become known as almost like a, a science guy, go-to guy? Like, when did you start to see that turn, that you were becoming known for this? Yeah, because I began by doing comedy. <laughs> <laughs> and whether or not it was that funny uh, isn't for me to say. Um, but the thing is, I loved hot sauce. Yeah. You know? I was really getting into it. I had moved to, to New York. I lived in Brooklyn. I was picking up awesome hot sauces from all around the world, and I'm like, why are these spicy? And I read that it's only spicy to mammals. Birds aren't bothered at all by jalapeno, by, by spicy peppers, because the plants don't care if they're eaten by birds. Birds just swallow the seeds and then poop it out along with all of its nutrients, but mammals have teeth that grind up and destroy the seeds, so keep them from eating. And I'm like, that's cool. I don't know, I'll do a video about the hottest pepper. Yeah. All of a sudden, uh, it took off. 
uh, and my mom was proud of it. She put it on her Facebook page. <laughs> that's and the I turning said, point, isn't it? That's when, the turning when point. When you get your mom to start sharing on her Facebook, you know you're doing something right. Was yeah. it, what was the pepper? Was it chili, like the ghost pepper? Was it one of those? I think or? it was like the boot jalokia at that time. Oh, jeez. Uh, we've got ghost peppers now, pretty yeah. famous. But I love the kind of art of breeding peppers and, and hobbyists that are competing against one another to make the hottest thing. And how do you, how do you even measure the heat of a pepper? Yeah. Well, there's a whole Scoville scale. Scoville and I go scale. through what that means. And yeah. do, you, do, you do, that, do you do that on the side as a hobby? Do you breed like peppers and stuff like that? No, or no time. No, I'd Not probably hurt, harm myself. I tried to yeah. do like a clam bake thing once, and I almost maced myself with the <laughs> the seasoning. Yeah, well, that's how you learn. Yeah. Uh, so, got it. More of a pepper enthusiast uh, than a hobbyist, I suppose. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. Do you uh, kind of recall? back then in those early days, like that turning point too, and it went from, I'm just putting videos on the internet to, oh, this is my job now. This is what I do. Well, do you remember Obama Girl? Obama Girl. I got there a crush go. on Obama, yeah. right? Yeah. That viral video. So, oh, yeah. So <laughs> the creator of that phenomenon sent me a message on YouTube and said, I like the videos you're making. They're really funny. Come out to New York. We'd love to work with you. And this was a real job. And I couldn't believe it. I didn't know that it would last as long as it did. I thought, all right, I'll do this for a couple of years after college, and then I'll have to go and do something real. But it became real as audience numbers went up, as advertisers got involved, as audiences started flocking to digital media. Now you can do a show like Mindfield, where yeah. you've got a giant crew, and you're bringing in all kinds of people and, and research institutions, and it's awesome. Was that a, a, a crazy adjustment for you to go from that world of self-produced, all these things, and then all of a sudden you've got this full crew, this full, like, you got to keep scheduling, you got all these different things. It w was it an adjustment, or were you ready for it? You were expecting it. You wanted it. You were hungry for it. I did a, I did a pilot, actually, yeah. for a cable network already, so I'd had some experience yeah. with with that, but man, I've learned so much. There's so many people that are smarter than me at production, mm -hmm. and that's what drew me to doing stuff like this. Everyone else in the room working on Minefield was smarter than me, and I was like, ah, oh, awesome. That's a good position to be in, because I can learn, and I really trusted everyone, and they really trusted that this was a science show, mm -hmm. that we weren't gonna fake anything, that when I went into isolation for three days, no one was going to disturb me unless it was life or death. And that really happened, you know? Which we're going to talk about that in a minute because I do want to get into that, which I'm sure you're sick of talking about because everybody asks you about that. But, uh, but I do have some questions. But I, before we get to that, I do want to tap into there is like this tone and this vibe to the show. I think it's a really safe assumption that as a kid you were influenced, and correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I, it feels like Bill Nye the Science Guy, Beekman's World, these kinds of shows that we grew up with. Uh, this feels like an adult. Like This is for me. Like as a person who saw that when I was a kid, anyone can really watch the show, but I really feel like there's, a, there's an underlying tone there to this of sort of like making science interesting and fun and sort of playing with it. Yeah, that, that science and math are not cages where you have to get the right answer or mm -hmm. you're punished. Instead, it's, it's creative and it's yeah. something that, it's a toolbox of paints that you can <clears throat> express yourself with. Uh, it's not just about science being fun, but it's about like, you know, science is something that we all can do and the scientific method and the, the logic behind math and all of these things are tools and um, they don't mean that if you're good at one, you have to be like, have no friends, <laughs> or you have to be a nerd, or uncomfortable with your body. You can be anyone, and you're gonna find things that are fascinating scientifically about the world. For sure. Um, you got to, speaking of those influences, uh, you got to, you're working with Adam from the Mythbusters. You, you worked a little bit with uh, Bill Nye at one point. You guys collabed on something. I remember well, seeing Well, yeah, it was not, I really just kind of ran into him yeah. and I said, hey, I so inspired by you. I'm doing an episode about why did the chicken cross the road? <laughs> yeah. The history of that joke. Why is it funny? Yeah. <laughs> when was it funny? <laughs> And so he was nice enough to be like, yeah, of course I'm game. And we recorded an intro and outro for that episode. And yeah. it was awesome. Is, was that, uh, that had to have been a pretty crazy surreal moment of this person. That's kind of the dream, right? Someone that inspired you. You get to one day work with them on something and do something like that, right? Yeah, with uh, Adam Savage. It was like, I heard he was looking for a touring partner. And I said, yeah, definitely throw my name in there. Pfft, not ever going to happen. And then all of a sudden I get a text. Hey, this is Adam Savage. Can you call me? Yeah, and we talked, later. and we learned that 
both of our goals were kind of all pointing towards the show, Brain Candy Live, that we're doing now. Yeah. We wanted to be able to do live science across the country, and there were things that you cannot demonstrate or teach through a screen. Yeah. You have to be there. For sure. What's the audience response been like so far? It's been crazy, it's right? Been, it's been great. Yeah. Um, they are really smart audiences, yeah. you know? And so we've, we've really molded the show to be about misconceptions. You know, we'll mm. do a thing that everyone's seen before, and they'll all go, yeah, yeah, Bernoulli principle, and we'll go, or is it? <laughs> and I, also, I just love the idea of a room full of people going, yeah, the Bernoulli principle again. It really <laughs> does happen, you know? And we have all ages there, so it's funny also to see the different reactions. You've got the grad students who are going, oh, yes, well, of course, that's uh, simply because of this. And we go, yeah, but also these things. Right. And da -da -da. But then we'll throw a bunch of toilet paper around and the kids are freaking out, you know? And it's just <laughs> yeah. great to see the different reactions. Uh, for sure. The last uh, sort of geek out question I'm going to ask you in terms of people you worked with, uh, David Attenborough. Yeah. I mean, come on. What an honor, right? Seriously, I, that's huge. So, so what was that like going into that? How did you get in touch with him? How did that all come together? Well, I used to live in London, and I worked with the BBC a lot, helping them with um, uh, BBC Earth and, and some of the yeah. YouTube programming that they were making. And uh, Leo Birch from the BBC was like, hey, Michael, if you can be in London on this day, Attenborough has 30 minutes. <laughs> and I was like, I'm there, I'm there. That's all I need, done. So, so I got to talk to him and it was phenomenal. I, I asked a lot about his advice to science communicators, mm -hmm. to people who are storytellers that are telling uh, stories about investigating science, um, learning about the natural world. And you know, he really understood that technology went hand in hand with that. Amazing. That Planet Earth 2 yeah. is a show that couldn't have been made back when planet Earth was made, when right. drones weren't nearly as easy to use, when we didn't have the same kind of understanding of the migration patterns of certain animals. Now we can set up traps yeah. that are camera traps that can get those pictures we want without disturbing them. It's just wonderful. I can't wait. I have the, uh, the 4K Blu-ray in my Amazon cart ready to go. Yeah. I'm just, that's going to be a whole weekend. Uh, okay, so I want to get into the show. I want to talk to you a little bit uh, about Minefield. Uh, real quick, just for people that haven't had a chance to check it out or see it yet, uh, what's unique about the show? What sets it apart? And then I'm going to start well, picking Well, on your my brain. normal... YouTube channel, I talk about things. And I might show images, but I don't ever do anything because it's just me. I do the research and the writing, and, and uh, as it turns out, if I wanted to do more, I had to have a lot of help. Uh, I wanted to recreate some of the most famous psychological experiments. Uh, we knew what the resu results would be, and you can read about them in textbooks, but no one had ever really captured them in HD, yeah. and it really explained the phenomenon and all the different variables involved. So we did everything from the famous Ash Line study on conformity all the way to tomorrow's episode about um, false memories. Like, what does it take for me to make you believe things happened to you as a child that never did? And what are the implications when it comes to the courtroom, to confessions, big stuff. It's, it's, it's fascinating. And um, you were saying, so you're recreating some of these famous studies to kind of experience them and see them firsthand. Right out of the gate, first episode that uh, anyone can watch right now, the first episode, you just yeah. go to Vsauce and check it out. And I highly recommend you do. You'll be hooked immediately. Uh, and, and you tackle sensory deprivation and isolation. And, and you locked yourself into a, a room for 72 hours, a completely white room, no stimuli, no nothing, just from what I can tell, tons of bottles of water, yeah. uh, and that was and it. And Soylent, I drank Soylent. Oh, did you really? <laughs> because I didn't want meals to be delivered, because even if they were randomized, I could still possibly use that as a clue to what time it really was. So I was in the room with all the food and water I would need, and nothing else. I didn't play with my shoelaces or yeah. socks, because I wanted to have nothing go into my head. Also, the lights never turned off. Yeah, I now, noticed that. <laughs> I, I, I interviewed a man who was in solitary confinement in a prison for five months, and what I went through was nothing like yeah. what I was doing it voluntarily, and the door wasn't even locked, because that wouldn't have been safe. If there had been an earthquake or, or a fire, right, right. Uh, but I, I, I started to get really confused because I was so cut off from the earth and from time. That was the worst part. I didn't get bored. I missed people, but it was only three days. What I really missed was knowing what time it was. Yeah, Is it time to go to bed? I don't know. I was, I was off by a day after my first sleep. Yeah. I thought that it was my final day, and it was still the first day. It was 
completely disheartening and frustrating. Well, it's, I totally missed that it was a deliberate move on your part to not at all try to maintain an awareness of time or anything like that. That that was, uh, I guess, the whole point of the experiment was to strip yourself of all of that and yeah. just sort of experience consciousness uninterrupted for 72 hours. Yeah, I was just less. alone with my yeah. own thoughts. And I did a lot of waking dreaming where yeah. I think my brain was processing things and I would see things that kind of resembled stuff that had happened in the past but was clearly being kind of invented. And it, it was a way of meditating, listening to that kind of waking dream. But every moment was like every other moment. I didn't, I couldn't tell how long ago I had had water last or yeah. how long it would be until I should change into my underpants and go to bed. I didn't know. Yeah. And it might be a little bit what it's like to be a bug or something where time is just a series of completely similar things and your your sense of time chronesthesia just doesn't it's not very evolved yeah yeah for sure but i don't know what it's like to be a bug so don't quote no, me on well, that no, all the possibly, bugs out there watching might be like possibly? um i very much understand the future and have ambition we're gonna get some really angry bug tweets I know. now because of that thank you uh you know you mentioned that you were alone with your own thoughts and uh when i came back to say hi to you earlier in the in the green room you were just kind of sitting there you know hanging out and doing your thing whereas i think a majority of people nowadays would be on their phone or using some kind of technology and don't really take time to be alone with their own thoughts uh, that brief little window that I had, was that an accurate glimpse into your approach? Do you take time throughout the day to separate yourself from technology and be with your own thoughts? Or, or was this like the first time in a while that you were, uh, had to sort of separate yourself and disconnect and, uh, and now you're, it's just you in there? Well, no, I mean, I'm always consuming something through my, right. into my head um, on a phone. I wasn't on a phone at the time because I was trying to think of a tweet. I'm trying to make this, an <laughs> this uh, acronym. It's like a funny joke tweet. Um, but I just don't think it's funny enough yet, so I was working on that. So but the wheel, yeah, yeah the isolation episode was the first time I really was that unplugged um, with no hope of, I couldn't even write things down. No, if, nice. And I, I figured I'd go in and I, I had all these things planned, like I'll learn the alphabet backwards, right? I will um, create a 3D crossword in my head. Yeah. No, I lost all motivation. Just staring at a wall was about the maximum I could do. It's pretty. It, it's a pretty fascinating and kind of fun, incredible thing to watch, and it really does make you think. We, we're running a little out of time. We're going to go to audience Q and A in a second, but I do want to talk about some of the other episodes that I got a chance to see. There was this uh, really great one uh, where you focus on touch, uh, and you do all these uh, really interesting, simple but like mind blowing experiments, like the cold hot hot dog thing. Yeah. Where uh, the brain perceives pain, even though. There's no reason to be in pain. The thermal grill illusion, the thermal which grill we still illusion. don't fully yeah. understand. So that's the, is that ever frustrating, or is that kind of part of the fun, is that we're doing these things that we still haven't figured out yet. We still don't know exactly why they do the thing that they do. That's the whole point of the yeah. show. I talk about outer space a lot on Vsauce, but there, I think, are even more mysteries in inner space, inside yeah. our heads, because it's really hard to investigate what's in here ethically. Uh, and so, you know, we can't Asterix. we can't ethically. take a baby and raise it without ever talking to it to see what it does. Right. Um, but you can easily well, isolate a proton. We could, but we proton, certainly shouldn't. We shouldn't do that. And we shouldn't yeah, do yeah. that. <laughs> um, but we can easily isolate a, an element or a proton yeah. and, and smash them into each other and destroy them and look at what's inside. But when it comes to why I like the color yellow more than I like orange... Why? Yeah, why? Well, that's uh, that's like I was saying, what I sort of latched onto the series that's so much fun about it is the exploration of how we're wired and, and trying to understand that wiring and looking for these loopholes and then having fun with them. Um, so the, that kind of ties into a question that we were talking briefly about uh, back there is, is you tackle sensory deprivation in the first episode, you tackle uh, touch in this one. Uh, and I'm hoping, do we know if there's going to be a season two or not yet? And if so, are you already f like making that list? Because I know I have a ton of things that I'd love to see you sort of explore. Yeah, we're talking about yeah. the next, what comes next. And I think a lot, there's a lot more me as a guinea pig because most of the things we want to do, we couldn't do to other people. Yeah. Um, so we're looking at sleep deprivation. We're looking at inverting vision for months at a time so that your brain rewires itself. Inverting yeah. how? Like swapping the eye or the color inversion or like actual like- Prisms that flip the world upside down. Whoa. It's, it's, it's dizzying at first, yeah. but your brain eventually figures it out. And we're also working with actual you know, universities on, we're going to do this and we want to do it right and we want to learn from it. And we want to not just do it as, isn't this crazy? But yeah. we wanted to do this and come away with um, 
an understanding of the scientific method. Yeah. Well, I, I look forward in, uh, to all of that and hope we can do it. There's one more thing we're going to do before we go to audience Q&A, because uh, we're running a little tight on time here. I was looking at the, the Vsauce subreddit. I don't, you go on Reddit from time to time, yes or no? Do you, I've heard of it, yeah. You've heard of Reddit. You're familiar. Uh, so uh, I was in the Vsauce subreddit, and this wasn't even a part of your AMA. This was just some poor soul putting a question out into the ether, hoping you'd read it. And uh -huh. I thought, let me bridge the gap. Uh, so Reddit user Ancient Shadow wanted to know, he says, hey there, I wanted to ask you about the research methodology you go through while preparing for a topic. Also, what are the little things people don't notice that make your presentations a great presentation? Wow. Got some good question askers yeah. there on the internet. So, I mean, the process is very much uh, one that begins with some kind of discovery I'll make in a book, uh, in a conversation with um, a friend, I'll say, wow, I didn't realize that. For instance, my next episode is about how much of the Earth can you see at once directly? And how close is the International Space Station to Earth? And, and how, how smooth is the Earth? Is it, is it really like rough if I held it? Or, or, you know, and so I've done all these calculations and then I kind of connect all the stories together and I pull from a lot of academic literature. If you look at the descriptions underneath my videos, they're incredibly long. They test the limits of how much you can type down there because I want to give everyone all the sources to go and read more and not just take my word for it. I'm just yeah. celebrating what real scientists do. I'm communicating and connecting the things that are being done out there and hopefully encouraging other people to do that in the future. Right. For sure. Uh, what was and the second part of the yeah, question? I was say, in the second things part of this see. question, I don't want to let ancient shadow down here. Uh, also, what are the little things people might not notice that you do that make your presentations great presentations? Like kind of making a sword. I'm always folding oh, things oh, over oh, and changing the order in, in post, meaning like after I've recorded it, I still record bits again and again and again, and I redo it, and I'll cut things, and I'll add new things in to try to make it as dense as possible with information. So it's not like I'm just coming in, talking off the top of my head, and then leaving. I've spent yeah. months uh, working on the script, um, and I've spent days, if not weeks, working on the animations and the, um, the way it's all going to be edited together and how the diagrams will work with what I say. Yeah. yeah, I think, well, all that comes, I think it's why you have, like, what, over 11 million subscribers or something like that on just one of the channels. Isn't that, that amazing? I mean, it's, 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 it's science, yeah. and, and people love it. Yeah, well, you make it, uh, you present it in a way that I think people love. So thank you for that. Uh, I could be super greedy and just ask you a million other questions, but we are going to turn it over to the audience and take a couple from cool. our friends here. So first one, I believe, is right here. Hey, Michael. Uh, I enjoy watching your show. I watched it since I was in college. And, thank you. you know, really entertaining. Uh, so I was wondering, like, with the concepts that you come up with, like, was there a time where uh, you thought it was good on paper, but then uh, when you materialized it, like, you thought to yourself that it might be a bit too hard or, like, it just probably won't be as easy as you thought it would be? That's every episode. <laughs> every episode, I, I, I say, ah, cool, I'll do that topic. But I want to do it deeper than... I'm just going to read you guys the Wikipedia page, right? So I keep asking why, but why, but why? Oh, because light refracts, and okay, but why does light refract? Oh, here's an analogy, but, 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 but why that? And how, oh, it fails here, and why does it fail there? And all of a sudden, it just ends with uh, the universe is going to explode someday. Not explode, but we're all going to die in a heat death at some point. So it becomes really existential. Um, and also, every episode, I feel like uh, a fear that it's not interesting, right? And I have to just trust that it was fascinating to me when I first heard about it. Weeks afterwards, I feel like it's just, you know, everyone knows this now. But I have to trust that, that my instincts were right and that I should keep things in that were at least fascinating the first time I heard them. It's always a struggle of, ah, oh, this is the worst video I've ever made. I can't believe it. I'm never afraid of anything being too complicated. I don't like using the word complicated at all because it turns people off from learning, makes them think, ah, some of us are built for it and some aren't. And that's not true. It sometimes just takes time. You can learn string theory if you just take some time uh, and you don't think that you're gonna just like read one book and all of a sudden like be able to you know, calculate things in 11 dimensions. Yeah. But uh, yeah. That'd be a hell of a book though, right? Like if there was one book that did that. I haven't yeah. found it yet. I know, well, for sure. Uh, <laughs> more questions, what do we got next? Hi, how are you? I'm good, how are you? I'm good. Um, I was wondering, since you perform on um, you majored in neuroscience, that's what you said? And neuropsychology, neuropsych so kind of a combo right. oh, that's of biology crazy. and psychology, yeah. That's 
super cool major. Um, and also English literature. I'm wondering, do you consider yourself a right brain person or a left brain person, or do you even think those people exist? No, I don't really believe in that kind of left and right stuff. Like in real life, I think that it's a good shorthand for describing personality types. And I don't really know, probably because I don't like being pigeonholed, you know? Uh, so that's why the channel's called Vsauce, because it doesn't mean anything. I could have called it like the nerd show, or I could have called it science, but I just wanted, I wanted it to mean nothing. So it could become anything. I can do episodes on cultural topics. Uh, I can do episodes about is music worse nowadays than it used to be? Uh, and, and I guess to answer your actual question, um, uh, which was what? <laughs> oh, like, do you think that people can be so, like, can identify as left-brained or right-brained, and what do you think you are? Yeah, see, I don't know, because I'm, I definitely like performing, but I think that a lot of that comes from the English literature uh, background that I have. I've read so many books, I, uh, fiction, nonfiction, everything, that I think I really was able to hone articulation and expression as a skill. That is one of the most important things when it comes to teaching. You need to be able to understand and see things in your head, but to put them into other people's heads, you have to know how to communicate. So, I don't know, I think it's just important to flex all the muscles of the brain. That's a, no, perfect, yeah, well said. Um, we do have time for one more, we're gonna go to it, but you had mentioned uh, uh, sort of being this multifaceted diamond, if you will, that you can tackle all these different things. You can do uh, science, you can do societal episodes. Uh, there's a, a great episode on artificial intelligence uh, that uh, you guys do in Minefield that shows some really interesting things and broaches the subject from an angle. I feel like everyone right now uh, on the news and when I was talking about artificial intelligence from an economic impact and how it's gonna hit us, but uh, the show really starts, I mean, you see a guy who has a relationship with, like a loving relationship with an app, and then you have the dating game experiment. Do you think we are just now starting to see the repercussions of this sort of artificial intelligence at a societal and cultural level, and, and kind of just your thoughts on where you think that's gonna go, man? Like what? I don't think we'll ever see the consequences. They'll be invisible to us, because it'll just happen too slowly. By the time we're all fighting for the rights of technology, um, we won't, there won't be living people around who remember a time before that was ever an issue, before we started to say, no, 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 this app feels love and you can't prove otherwise. It's indistinguishable from human behavior. By the time we, we reach a, a world like that, it'll be the only world anyone alive knows and we won't have seen it coming. But uh, it's, it's also amazing to think about preserving ourselves. Um, I talked to a guy who is recording his mother saying every single word in the dictionary, and then it, it's listening to her talk uh, late, late in her life, and it's, re it's learning how she speaks. It's this neural network he's built that is going to be as close to his mom as technology allows, so that when she passes away, he can talk to her and hear her voice. It's really interesting. My immediate reaction to that is like, whoa, interesting, and then like kind of creepy, but is it? Like I'm like struggling with that concept. I've never even thought of like trying to capture a loved one's essence in a machine before. Uh, yeah, and should, I mean, his mom's down for it. Yeah, right, so okay. What if, right. I, what if I just want to die and yeah. not come back or still be around forever? I, I don't know, it's a crazy question, and it's one that we will have to answer. Man, I hope you get that season two. <laughs> All right, <laughs> Me too. Uh, we, got, we got time for uh, one more question. Let's go ahead right here. Hello. Hi. Um, my question was kind of stolen, but I have another one, so it's okay. Uh, no, it's all good. I was wondering um, if you could talk about a time where you really wanted to do a study, but it was just too dangerous or for whatever reason you couldn't. Good question. Um, so normally the challenge isn't that it's too dangerous. It's that it's probably not visual enough, right? There's always that battle between this is fascinating and then you've got the, the producer side that says, yeah, but it's a little boring. And you're like, no, it's not, trust me. And that's, that's the way it was with the Ash Line study. It's literally people looking at lines. But everyone in the room except one person is a liar who's working for you and they're in on it and they're giving the wrong answer out loud. Can you make that one person who's not a Confederate just fit in with the crowd. And the drama that comes out of that experiment is fascinating, even though it's not huge explosions and, and you know, big fancy visual demonstrations. 
I'm trying to think of things that were dangerous. Um, I mean, I think that we always had to be very, very careful when we did the nocebo effect and we yeah. made people think that we were um, using a device that would cause pain. We really just kind of had to stop because yeah. they were experiencing pain, even though they had no reason to. It was just a flashlight uh, shining on their arm, but they would start crying and we just had to stop. And there's no point in going too far. I mean, the, the, what we want to do is learn about humans. We don't want right. to uh, hurt them. The, the whole point is to learn more about them so we can you know, act better. The, the nocebo effect was particularly like mind-blowing to see them. H has there ever been an example, I know I could have just looked this up myself, but I didn't, I have you here, so now I'm asking, has there ever been an example of the, the pain that they're feeling mentally actually manifesting itself physically in some way? Like, has the, does the mind have that power to in some way a rash or something conjure up an actual physical... Yeah, it's, yeah. it's a whole convoluted yeah. storm. Uh, I can work myself into a fit and make myself puke. Um, yeah. I mean, I don't know, maybe I couldn't, but you, 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 one can do that, right? <laughs> Mind and body are really intertwined, and where one ends and the other begins is a question that I don't think we're ever going to answer, but we can at least play around with and, and, and ask, how can we make this scientifically testable? What can we know for, well, for sure? Well, uh, like I said repeatedly, and it's true every time, I could keep you here all day, but unfortunately, I got to let you go. Guys, the show Minefield, it's on YouTube Red right now. I'm telling you, you'll love it. You'll watch one, you're hooked. Please join me in thanking one more time Michael Stevens, everybody. Thank you. <laughs>